I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sally Bachman. I have the great privilege of serving as the Dean of the School of Social Policy and Practice, also known as SP2. I'm very excited to welcome you to this installment of our 2023-2024 speaker series, Conversations About Race, Equity, and Justice with Experts on Social Policy and Social Work. Today's program is entitled Climate Refugees, the Implications of Our Changing Environment. And as usual, it's hosted by our friend, Ben Jealous, a professor of practice at the Annenberg School for Communication and of course at SP2. Ben is a former national president and CEO of the NAACP, and he's now the executive director of the Sierra Club. He has an unwavering commitment to social change and racial justice that really is in perfect alignment with our mission. When he was selected to head the NAACP at age 35, he became the organization's youngest ever national leader. His family's strong community activism dates back generations and his S2 connection traces back many decades to his late beloved grandmother, who we're proud to say was an SB2 alumna. As we confront the ongoing issues of environmental, race, racial, social, global, and economic justice, it continues to be important to explore these topics. This conversation reflects SP2's understanding of the climate crisis as a significant social justice issue, and it's an example of our dedication to addressing complex social problems through education, research, and civic engagement. And now it brings me great joy to introduce my friend and colleague, Mr. Ben Jealous. Thank you, Sally. You know, I continue to be super excited about these lunchtime kind of engagements that we do. And uh, today's conversation about environmental justice, looking at it more globally is uh, really, really exciting to me. If you have any questions during the event, please use the Q&A tab to submit them. And we'll get to as many as we can later in the program. Caitlin does a great job of helping us with that. And now it's my extinct and now it's my distinct honor to introduce today's speakers. Dr. Jason Park, an assistant professor here at SP2 and at Wharton. Dr. Park is an environmental and labor economist, interested broadly in how, in, how environmental factors shape opportunity. Prior to joining Penn, he was a member of the faculty at UCLA and a postdoctoral fellow at Harvard. Dr. Alice Hu, also an assistant professor at SP2 with a secondary appointment in the poli-sci department in the College of the Arts and Sciences. She studies the impact of environmental policies on the global south. She was previously a postdoctoral associate at the Yale Leitner program in international and comparative political economy. I'm excited about our conversation today. Dr. Park and Dr. Hu, you are both, you both study climate change from an interdisciplinary perspective. Dr. Park, one of your research areas is environmental economics. And Dr. Hu, one of your fields is environmental politics. Could you each describe how you define those fields and how they provide special insight into the climate crisis that is affecting all of us on this planet together? Should I start? Go ahead. Yeah, please. Yeah, no, so first of all, uh, Dean Bachman, thank you so much for, for the introductions and for providing this venue. Uh, and Ben, it, it, it's great. It's great to be able to to discuss these issues with you and, and the wider public um, and, and to welcome our, our new colleague, Alice, in the process. So in brief, I don't know if I can define environmental economics per se, but as it pertains to climate change and the research that I do, uh, you know, I like to think of it as trying to put numbers behind some of the human consequences of climate change, including how climate change may affect and be affected by and be affected by 
uh, economic inequality in all of its uh, various forms. Um, and I also like to think of it as a way of disciplining our thinking around potential policy solutions, right? To try to um, be mindful of how we collect evidence, how we use that evidence to think about the kinds of policy solutions that are available and how ultimately, um, you know, whether it's in terms of policies to reduce greenhouse gas emissions or to help communities adapt to climate change, uh, particularly those most vulnerable. Um, I like to think of environmental economics as a set of tools that, you know, really help us do that with more, more rigor and more precision and ultimately uh, to the benefit of, you know, the, the, the communities and people uh, who we seek to serve. Yeah, yeah, to add on to that, um, yeah, thank you so much again, Ben, um, and also Dean Bachman for uh, the introductions and the invitation, and thank you also to Kristen and Caitlin for organizing this event. Um, so uh, for the environmental politics side of things, climate change is arguably um, the greatest, or at least one of the greatest challenges um, facing our world today, and the political challenges uh, to addressing it in my opinion, is at least as pressing as, you know, the technological problems and the scientific questions that climate change poses. And so environmental politics scholarship has provided timely and policy relevant insights on this front. Environmental politics is an area of study within the discipline of political science. Uh, political science more broadly is the study of politics and policy, but also it's a discipline that studies who, how, why, and the under what conditions uh, do some policies to some policies get passed and not others. And political scientists are increasingly turning their attention to the ways in which government institutions, interest groups, public participation in international organizations affect responses to pressing environmental issues. So the focus is both on the top down and the bottom up. So from the top down, the focus is on understanding how politics, so politicians, institutions, and organizations, how politics can induce or limit environmental degradation, how politics can mitigate the effects of climate change and respond to its effects, and how politics can structure uh, transitions to clean energy, among other examples. And from the bottom up, environmental politics is about understanding voters. So the individual voters and how they develop preferences and public attitudes about climate change and climate policy. Who supports climate policy and when and why? Um, and also from the bottom up, it's about uh, looking at the local levels for different communities, how they build social capital and collectively mobilize their communities to adapt to climate change and respond to its uh, cross-cutting effects. Um, so yeah, I guess I just, you know, wanted to emphasize that uh, our politicians, our policymakers, for better or for worse, decide how to run this world. And part of environmental politics is largely about understanding uh, the design of elections and government institutions that structure the incentives of our policymakers, their sources of power and constraints on their power, the formation of their preferences, the origins of their ideologies, among other dimensions. And um, for understanding climate change, the politics, in my opinion, has always been underemphasized as an area of study. It's a growing but uh, rather newer area of study. And again, while the science, the engineering, and the economics literatures about the environment are much more advanced, environmental politics has not received as much attention, but I think it's just so important um, because we spend so much time uh, thinking about the best ways to design policy programs to make them more effective, but we should also be thinking critically about the politicians, the puppeteers behind whether the program even gets voted on in Congress and whether the agenda passes. Uh, some policies that are politically feasible in a state like California would not be in Alabama or Florida, for example. And so understanding the politics and politicians incentives, the institutions that constrain them uh, is just as important. This is what environmental politics is about and why it's important. Gotcha. And, and, and how does that, I mean, it strikes me that we're getting lessons in all of this sort of every day on the news. You know, uh, Vice President Gore, uh, 
you know, says that, you know, the, the nightly news has become a daily hike through the book of Revelation. Uh, you know, there's just so many storms, there's so many disasters. Um, and you look at our own politics in this country, a candidate like Donald Trump. Right? In, the, uh, in his first campaign, he uh, presented himself as the defender of the coal worker. Right? Never mind that um, automation and robotics are, re are replacing coal workers faster, uh, you know, coal miners faster than, than anything else. The coal miner, now he presents himself as the defender of the auto worker making the traditional combustion engine, uh, you know, against this looming threat of EVs and change. And, and of course, about a quarter of the GOP's PAC dollars come from the oil and gas industry. And when you look globally, there's a similar dynamic. Uh, oil, you know, so where is um, kind of what are you seeing on the ground when you look at the global south as far as dynamics in West Africa or South uh, uh, South America, and to what extent is the oil and gas industry itself a factor in uh, magnifying those conflicts? Um, so for me, I would say that uh, thinking in terms of, you know, fossil fuel energy relative to renewables, um, like with social policy, which for me is a distributive politics problem, it's very much about um, taxes, raising taxes to tax the rich in order to be able to be in a position to finance social policy and redistribute to those in need. Similarly, um, environmental policy and uh, support for renewable energy is um, a distributive politics problem in the sense that uh, there, there are always economic you know, losers and economic winners in this transition. Um, and therefore, it's very much um, a societal negotiation about how we can, I guess, compensate those who um, will be left behind uh, to make this shift to more sustainable development. Um, so, you know, for, I guess, like, like oil and gas um, in the United States and also in the global south in Latin America or in, in, in like select with West African countries, it is the case um, that that historically okay. has been where. I found this on the web for it's very much about taxes, raising taxes to tax the rich. And I'm going to be. <laughs> Sounds like your technology is rebelling. <laughs> okay, <go on. laughs> I think so. um, it's very much by where where I guess like the money historically has been concentrated and therefore there's been a lot of pushback in making this transition to more cleaner energies um, and there needs to be negotiation uh, politically especially for making this transition. Is there a is there a conflict in the global south you find especially fascinating just to give us an example kind of what you see in your scholarship that we may not be seeing on the news. So something that you think is instructive? A conflict? Is a specific example on the ground? A conflict? Yeah, just like political dynamics. I say conflict broadly. I'm an organizer, so we deal in conflict all day. But but what I'm talking about is, you know, is there a, is there a political dynamic you see unfolding in the global South in a specific place that keeps you up at night or that you think others should really understand what is suggested? about the future that we're in for? Um, yeah, I think so. Uh, you mean like within the Global South or between the Global South and the yeah. Global North? Okay, no, within the like Global within, South. Like within, like you get okay. on like micro for a second. Yeah. Okay, um, so I think within the Global South, um, one area of conflict that I'm seeing is that um, there are many cases in which um, social policy, so um, pro-poor interest, are at odds with environmental policy, um, sustainability, the need for sustainability. So I guess um, to give a particular example, um, and this relates to how climate change exacerbates inequities, uh, and this is part of also my, my own research. So in one project I study uh, the political and historical causes of the growth of informal slum settlements in developing cities in Brazil. And slums in developing cities are a consequence of rapid and large waves of migration of the rural poor to cities. 
And once the in-migrating rural poor arrive in cities, historically, they tend to settle in parts of the city that are left unoccupied, which tends to be environmentally protected areas. And because of these historical settlement mm. pat patterns, the slum residents of developing cities are present day often at risk of getting evicted by the government because they settle on environmentally protected areas. In fact, mm. one of the common justifications used by local governments for evicting and demolishing slum settlements are uh, environmental justifications, whether it's actually justification is often in question. Usually these uh, demolished slums are located in central parts of the city on urban land that has high real estate value. But the government used the justification of environmental concerns to evict these settlements. So, um, you know, because of the historical patterns of slum formation, we see today that within cities, within countries, the poorest of the poor are living in these slum settlements that are most vul vulnerable to getting evicted and demolished. And um, this just creates a series of conflicts because I, you know, in this, I guess, ongoing study that I'm conducting, I find that the geographic overlay of slums with environmentally protected areas and cities polarizes left-wing politics in local elections. This creates a split in political coalitions between green parties with ideological incentives for, for protecting ecologically valuable land and other parties of the local left with the symbolic incentives to signal a pro-poor stance. So in this case, um, because the policy goal of helping the poor is at odds with environmental goals in the city, this creates a split and it weakens both government incentives to pass environmental policy and also social policy. Well, well. Ben, could I add to, to what Alice just yeah, said? Yeah, I was, I was about to come to you with a question, but please. Well, jump before, in. And I'd love to hear the question, but just because both of you brought up so many interesting points um, that I can't help but want to weigh in on. Um, jump in. You know, at the risk of over editorializing, one of the things that's so exciting to me about you know, the kind of interdisciplinary nature of a place like SP2 and the addition of, you know, faculty like Alice in conjunction with myself is that there's so many complementarities. You know, I, as an economist, don't pretend to know much about how the data and research findings that I produce are ultimately used by politicians and policymakers and how the political economy of particular countries or locations affects, right, that that translation from knowledge to policy action. Um, and so it's great to have a colleague like Alice who we, you know, we can talk about these things. Um, a, a theme that I think you both of you brought up was just this intersection, right, between climate change and economic inequality. I don't think it's, I don't think it can be overstated just how many subtle ways in which climate change both the physical effects of climate change and the policy responses to it, how they sort of mesh sometimes, well, often in ways that it may exacerbate underlying inequalities. And Ben, to your point earlier, you know, I think it's really important that we understand the broader trends in economic inequality, totally distinct from climate change, so that we can think about the effects of climate change in that kind of contextualized environment, right? It, I think it is important to know that, right, wage inequality in the U.S. has been rising over the past several decades, and there are many reasons for that, one of which is that automation, another has to do with differences in, you know, the policy regime and so on and so forth. But unless we know that ahead of time and, and then are able to pinpoint the ways in which, say, workers without a bachelor's degree or immigrant workers, et cetera, et cetera, are more or less likely to be affected by climate change or climate policy. I don't think we can even begin to have an informed conversation. I won't even bring in Donald Trump, even before we get to that level of non-informedness. Um, you know, I think it's really important to have the right inputs to that conversation. And that's what excites me. And I'm, I'm sure Alex would agree um, about, you know, the kind of scholarship opportunities that, that we have ahead of us. Um, one last point I wanted to make is that, uh, uh, you know, don't let me speak on your behalf, Alice, but I would imagine that, you know, you're a political scientist, I'm an environmental economist, but we're also both in some ways data scientists as well. And, and we like to leverage the power of data in informing um, 
policy solutions. And no matter what your theory of change happens to be, I would I would argue that it, you know uh, a necessary condition mm -hmm. is knowing the facts on the ground. And so when it comes to climate change um, policy, I think both of us are motivated by trying to. Um, broaden and deepen the evidentiary basis upon which both politicians and policymakers, as well as the general public, can make decisions about climate change, whether it's deciding who to vote for or deciding how to adapt your local community to extreme heat or floods or wildfire, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, uh, Ji Sung, you know, we, we often talk about like the future of work and the future of opportunity in the context yeah. of of tech and automation, but what do you, how do you see climate having impact? You know, out here as an organizer, you know, it, um, you know, I think of uh, all the ways in which, you know, obviously poverty makes people vulnerable to, to sure. climate change, whether it's poor housing, lack of air conditioning, or just simply living in the bottoms where the land has always been cheaper, but it also floods faster. Um, and I, and I also think about the, the anxieties of small business people I've met with. I remember being in Tuscaloosa after 55 tornadoes tore up that college town. The biggest one was a mile and a half wide at its base. And somehow the way that tornadoes are stereotyped, it missed all the rich neighborhoods. It just seemed to hit the poor neighborhoods. And I was standing with a McDonald's manager and he was already mourning that there would be no more housing for his workers within 20 miles of his restaurant because all I that you know, housing that was like historical kind of legacy workforce housing, he was certain would be replaced essentially with condominiums for people who want to come to football games and then Airbnb them the rest of the year. <laughs> and so uh, like, what do you see as far as climate change and how it impacts opportunity in the future? Great question. Please, please feel free to shut me up because I may just go on for the rest of the hour. Okay, so uh, <laughs> where to begin? Uh, first, there is growing evidence to support this idea that climate gentrification is a thing. There have been studies in economics and other fields that have shown that um, due to the way that real estate markets work, in a sense, the most climate risky places tend to sort of be lower income individuals and households tend to be funneled to the most climate exposed parts of a city, for instance, due to the way that real estate prices shake out, right? I mean, uh, how much you can afford, how much you pay for your housing is both the function of your willingness to pay, but also your ability to pay. And so if all of us would rather live in a part of the, you know, let's just stick with a, a city that I spent some time in, uh, in my previous job in Los Angeles, if all of us would rather live in a tree-lined, relatively cool part of the city, say Santa Monica, and would prefer not to live in a place that is more exposed to extreme heat, more exposed to wildfire smoke, more exposed uh, you know, to other climate hazards, then naturally, unless there are countervailing policy responses, housing, afford housing prices will sort out in such a way that higher income folks will be able to live in the protected areas and lower income folks will live in the riskiest area. So that, you know, some people have called that climate gentrification and the data in increasingly supports that as a general phenomenon in many parts of the world. So that's one. Um, just to take a step back, I like to categorize in my mind climate risk in the form of at least two big buckets, one having to do with physical risk, whether that's extreme heat, floods, wildfire, et cetera. And another having to do with what's called transition risk. And I think you kind of alluded to this earlier, Ben, this is the risk to workers, firms, families, et cetera, from the policy responses that we will need to take in order to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. And because that will necessarily result in shifting industries, a lot of people are gonna lose their jobs, right? Energy bills may be more expensive. Et cetera, et cetera. So these kinds of risks uh, are just as important, I would argue, as the physical risks. Maybe to end with one, two examples. Um, so in, work, in some work that my colleagues at the World Bank and the Federal Reserve and I have done, 
you know, we take uh, data from many millions of workers' compensation uh, insurance claims to basically show that extreme heat increases the risk of workplace injury for many, many thousands of workers. This is looking at California. And that that increase in risk is much higher for the kinds of workers that we talked about earlier who are already adversely affected by automation and technical change, right? These are the um, lower income workers without a bachelor's degree working in, you know, landscaping, construction, warehousing, et cetera. They're also more likely to be hurt on the job because of extreme heat uh, due to climate change. That's just one quick example. Another example of how economic opportunity matters is the transition risk, right? So again, I, you know, one of my other hats is as a labor economist and uh, my colleague Mark Curtis and I have done some work looking at how, depending on your level of education or your age uh, or your education, or sorry, your, um, where you live geographically, how likely are you to be able to transition from your current industry to a green or a clean tech job, right? And it turns out that varies enormously. There are some parts of the country where, you know, the transition rate is relatively high for reasons that we don't yet fully understand. And there are other parts of the country or particularly for older workers um, and less educated workers, it looks like if you work in the oil industry, it's, you know, it's going to be tough times ahead for you. And it is an important policy imperative to figure out, right? We as a global society need to, collectively reduce emissions, but if some parts of society are going to pay more of the cost, you know, it maybe behooves policymakers to think carefully about how we're going to um, engage in that kind of redistribution that Alice referred to earlier, um, because it's a collective response to a global problem. And uh, again, kind of going back down to the ground, as you look at different communities, look at California, elsewhere, is there anything that's really surprised you, you found counterintuitive? Yeah, I, I mean, when you're holding a hammer, everything looks like a nail, and I've been kind of holding the heat hammer for a while, but I was genuinely surprised at how, how many jobs and workers there are out there, even in the US, which is you know, one of the richest economies in the world, that are really, really exposed to the elements, right? I mean, all of us, we typically work in air conditioned, <laughs> varyingly air conditioned, uh, Sally will laugh, uh, office environments, but there are at least 100 million workers in this country alone where that's not the case, where you're either working outdoors on a construction site or indoors in a manufacturing facility that is very costly to air condition. And so, you know, for us, a 90 degree day is kind of an annoyance, but it turns out for many of these workers, it could be life or death or at least serious, you know, bodily harm, um, particularly if you're operating in very dangerous environments like, you know, heavy machinery, chemicals, fumes and heat just sort of seems to increase the risk of things going wrong in a really bad way. Um, I always knew that that was a possibility, but the, I was sort of surprised at how pervasive that. Yeah. Was. Yeah. You see like increases in kidney disease as people get more dehydrated. Um, yeah. And even not just like falling off of a ladder or like getting hit by a crane, you know, that increases on a hot day. Um, wow. Yeah, people are are distracted or impacted in ways that impair their judgment. Exactly. exactly. Oh. Oh. Alice, um, what gives you hope? You know, there's so much uh, in you know happening in the world these days that has all of us concerned. A lot of it, frankly, driven uh, or exacerbated by climate change, water scarcity, geopolitics about oil, etc. What is giving you hope in what you see? Yeah, thanks, Sam. that's a great question. Um, I, and I guess this like tacks on to just what we were discussing previously or what Jason just said about, um, you know, unfortunately it is the case that climate related disasters uh, hit the already disadvantaged, the poorest and most marginalized communities the hardest. 
It exacerbates existing um, vulnerabilities and inequities. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, like both between nations in the sense that much of the initial effects are felt uh, first and foremost among the poor developing nations in the global south. Uh, for example, it has, um, you know, the common example that's like used in the media is populations living in coastal areas, and low lying areas, um, poor island nations such as the Maldives, and then thinking within cities, I talked about how slum settlements are located in protected areas, and this makes them at risk. Uh, so what I think like, there are two parts to this. Um, one is that uh, understanding the recognition, and we're just beginning to, I guess, understand and recognize that um, the reason why uh, it seems like the poor are the one, the poor areas of a city or a country are most hit by these climatic disasters, whereas, you know, the middle and upper class, the wealthier areas are largely excluded from uh, the bulk of the effects. The reason why we're seeing this is uh, in part first, like historically where the poor areas developed are the areas that are most, they are, um, I guess, like most prone to like landslides and flash floods. Those are the areas that are um, least favorable for settling and therefore the wealthy have historically sorted out and opted out of those areas. And, you know, for these reasons, um, this partly uh, accounts for the inequities we're seeing today in terms of the incidence of climatic disasters and where it's hitting. And the second part of it is also what Ji Sung uh, talked about, which is um, adaptation. The capacity to adapt also varies across um, different identity-based groups, whether it's based on class-based identities or racial and ethnic identities, um, uh, you know, we, like Ji Sung said, like for us, um, a, a 103 degree weather day, which rains, we can just pump up our ACs and call it a day. Whereas, you know, if you're not financially in a position to do so, it really affects your lives and your productivity, uh, your ability to, you know, even do your work and get paid. And, you know, in all forms, it could even affect, you um, your ability to stay alive. There, there are just like so many things about uh, differences in capacity to adapt that really matters. But um, what gives me hope is that we're just starting to recognize that there are these inequities, um, both in terms of how geographically our cities, uh, our nations formed, um, you know, geographically where there is opportunities and advantage in the first place. This recognition is so important. And in addition, recognizing that there are these uh, differences in capacity to adapt. So we're just beginning to start conversations around this, um, I guess, internationally. Yeah, I mean, looking at, um, so there's gonna be a big UN gathering called COP coming up in a couple months. A lot of this will be kind of top of the agenda there. And there'll be a lot of discussion there about climate refugees. Um, I think in the U.S., the first time that we really became aware was probably right after Hurricane Katrina, when it seemed like every city in America suddenly had a new New Orleans brass band that had recently arrived. Um, the, uh, and, uh, you know, there were, there were a lot of folks who moved to Houston, for instance, and then there was a storm in Houston, and there were some families that moved from New Orleans to Houston that then moved from Houston to somewhere else. In the global south, uh, Alice, talk about what you see. Uh, and what the concerns are. And again, if you can get micro and give an example just to help people, you know, uh, understand the textures of it, that would be great. Uh, climate migration, you mean? Yeah, climate refugees. Just, just talk about how you define climate refugee in your work and an example of the sort of uh, dynamics that you're seeing that we may not see here, um, but are beginning to appear elsewhere or that we do see here, but we misinterpret. I mean, a lot of people say, a lot of folks coming across our southern border are coming from further south than Mexico and are climate refugees, but just kind of break it down, how you define climate refugee and what you're seeing in the global south that we should be thinking about. 
Yeah, so um, a consequence of um, climate change is, you know, increasingly erratic uh, and extreme weather events such as hurricanes, cyclones, floods, wildfires, uh, droughts, even earthquakes to some extent, and these different forms of natural disasters have just to date, um, I think, displaced uh, over 300 million peoples worldwide, according to you know recent reports. So this is not just something that's predicted to happen, but this is something that's happening right now. And um, thinking in terms of the global south, it's so important to think in terms of the global south. Although you know, in the U.S., I guess like it's easy to just like disregard. Uh, this and have more of a U.S. centric view, but it does concern us in many ways because it results in displacement, in cross border migration, and a climate refugee is colloquially, I guess, a person who um, has been displaced from their home as a result of climate related, uh, a climate related event. So they're forced to cross international borders. Uh, that is, I guess, the colloquial definition of climate refugee, but there's actually not even a clear definition of climate refugee more formally, because um, traditionally the defi definition of a refugee in uh, international politics is a person who is displaced from their home and forced to cross borders out of fear of persecution because of their race, religion, nationality, political opinion, or because of their membership in a particular social or ethnic group. Um, but climate refugees, actually, in my understanding, are not even recognized in the 1951 Global Refugee Convention, for example. So what it means to... Well, well in part, I mean, what part of what you're putting it all together, you're talking about people who, their, their class in their country, even more than their ethnic group, maybe the number one reason that they're moving, right? Just not having the means to yeah, adapt in all the ways. Yeah, but they are not recognized as refugees formally because, um, you know, climate change is not, I guess, his historically uh, lumped into the defini definition of a reason for cross-border migration. Um, and we're just beginning to define and understand this. Uh, and this is uh, problematic because what it means to be a climate refugee is uncertain, both legally and in practice. And this legal void um, has all types of consequences for these displaced peoples, because I guess like the main issue is that climate change currently cannot be cited as a reason for seeking, seeking asylum or refugee status in host countries, even for international organizations and alliances such as the European Union, climate refugees are not formally recognized as a group with formal refugee status. This legal void also has other consequences because we, can, we cannot effectively define this migrant population. And therefore it creates barriers for measuring just the sheer scale of cross-border climate change induced migration and for effectively collecting data on these populations. So it's almost like a catch-22 in the sense that, you know, the lack of precise data creates this legal void and it also pre prevents implementation of an, an international legal framework for finding this population and addressing this issue. And data is, you know, so important um, as Jisung, Jisung discussed earlier. So I just wanna also emphasize that. Yeah, no, amen. Well, I'm going to turn us to some questions to the audience. We're starting to get a few. I'll encourage anybody else to put them in. Uh, our first question comes to us from Cynthia Hoyle, a great actress. Uh, it says, do the impacts of climate change on the economic and political systems of already poor and perhaps otherwise unstable countries, it seems we can expect to see more mass migration of climate refugees. Mm -hmm. Do you see the political response to this in wealthier countries to be towards more a more authoritarian political leader. Uh, and, you know, I think what comes to mind is like Ron DeSantis's response to the re Republican debate, saying that uh, illegal immigrants will be shot on sight at the southern border. Um, you know, like, what are you seeing kind of more at a macro level across countries? So you see a rise of authoritarian response to the emergence of climate refugees as a constant dynamic. I don't know. Scientist colleague here. I mean, I have some other comments, but I think you you're you're more the authority on that dimension. 
Uh, yeah, so I think, uh, you know, in terms of political response, um, I think for Ben, what you mentioned, I think that's exactly right in thinking in terms of like immigration policy and our stance towards refugees. Um, and it could be quite authoritarian, even in a democratic context, such as the US, in the sense that, you know, previously, we had uh, Donald Trump for four years, and his stance was very much about how uh, not giving these populations the light of day, not being accepting of in-migration, um, regardless of how vulnerable or at risk or regardless of their situation previously, not uh, opening up our borders. Um, so even in a democratic context such as the U.S., West, it could be very much authoritarian. Locally, we see this to be the case with, um, I guess, in New York City with Mayor Eric Adams and his stance towards migrant populations from the global south, especially from Mexico, Venezuela, and uh, Latin American countries. So even locally, um, politicians can have this stance. But um, overall, I do think that um, you know, in a democratic context such as the U.S., the great thing is that voters have have sway they can vote and express their political voice both locally in New York City and also um, in terms of like who gets to govern federally. And therefore this really, um, I guess affects our, our stance and therefore there's more representation and voice. Whereas um, in, you know, more authoritarian contexts such as uh, in, in uh, China, for example, they could, the CPC, uh, in China could just like command and control direct uh, policies, both locally and centralized policies federally. And they could take um, a definitive stance against displaced populations without even heeding the voice of the masses. Yes. You know, it's funny, as you were talking, what came to mind for me and, uh, and folks, if you, if you haven't read it, I, I would recommend every American read this, is Frederick Douglass's speech, Our Composite Nation which was his tirade against the Chinese Exclusion Act. And one of the points that he made there um, was that uh, essentially that human beings have a right to migration, that if you look at any impoverished person uh, showing up in this country, back then it was concerned about Chinese railroad workers and whites, a certain set of whites in California feeling like they would be displaced. Um, and... Uh, and he said, look, you know, essentially, if you were as impoverished as, as those railroad workers are, like, you would do whatever it took to support your family, too. And I think that's what I worry about is as us in a, in a country that's already quick to dehumanize people based on color or class, that we go even further. You know, and that's what I found so troubling about Ron DeSantis' comments. Um, maybe I'm a bit jaded by Donald Trump at this point, but I would expect more from the governor of a state as diverse as, as, as Florida. Taryn, Taryn Painter asked for us to just talk for a moment about stateless refugees. And, you know, the, um, just as I was I'm sure it was an education for folks earlier when you said, you know, look, there's actually certain boxes you have to check to be considered a refugee, even if you actually are one, because climate refugees are absolutely refugees, even if they don't meet some bureaucratic definition over at the UN. Um, uh, talk to us about stateless people and stateless refugees and, and what this means. I know. Uh, in Africa, for example, there are a number of groups uh, that are migratory, you know, that kind of move from place to place and where they can uh, get what they need to subsist has changed because of climate change and that has crossed some lines and, and created some tense politics. Um, you know, what do you see uh, as far as stateless people and stateless refugees? Alice, I think you're the... You know, economists like to act like they're just kind of like politics. They don't really affect us, even though they're very political beings. But but uh, if you would, if you would, <laughs> talk about Thanks to differ, Ben, uh, but go ahead. Yeah, that was an invitation for you to jump in. I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, stateless refugees, um, you know, it's so tricky, tricky for them because so again, it's part. It's part of part of it is the recognition of what it means to be a refugee, as I discussed earlier. And um, when you're stateless, um, there is no leverage in terms of negotiations with host countries. Uh, there is no going back. You know, there's no home. There's no uh, 
it's it's not a voluntary migration in the sense that um you know there are all types of all types and all forms of cross-border migration happening globally uh, some of it is voluntary in search of better economic opportunities um, and for these people if it doesn't work out in host countries or cities they always have an outlet which is to return back but for stateless refugees there's no going back because their homes have been destroyed or they've been displaced for, for these precise reasons related to climate or other reasons, conflict. Um, and therefore, um, there's very little leverage for these populations once they arrive in host countries. All they can ask is for empathy and solidarity and asking for open borders because there's nowhere to return. And um, this is also important for international negotiations or for international relations and international politics because if um, refugees are stateless, it's not like their home country can, you know, think in terms of the benefits of the diaspora and cater to these populations and negotiate with host countries to improve the welfare of um, these migrants. They don't have home countries or, or states to negotiate on their behalf for um, international agreements and treaties and whatnot. Um, so I think it's uh, such a pressing issue to think more about this and to clearly define this population. Can I, mm -hmm. can I ask after that, Ben? So I- Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I think, I thought Alice gave such a such a thoughtful and, and sincere response. And I, if I could just make one quick personal comment before I make a more, I guess, academic one, um, or scholastic one. That I'm with both of you. I find it very concerning the, the possibility and maybe already the manifestation of this possibility of, you know, uh, climate, climate refugees, the pressure to increase migration, right? the pressures toward increased cross-border migration because of climate change, combining with either a rise of authoritarianism or populism or just the general human instinct to in, in tough times demonize right entities that we don't either understand or don't look like us or who are outsiders. I find that to be just a very um a heart-wrenching phenomenon. And I, I do worry that that will, you know, get worse before it gets better. And that begs the question of how it gets better. Um, I did want to make a contextual point about what we do or do and do not know about climate migration. And I thought Alice did a great job of, of giving us um, some data points. My understanding of this literature, and it's still a really quickly evolving literature, is that there's actually some evidence to suggest that um, as much as climate change may increase cross-border migration, for the, for the really poor and vulnerable communities, they won't even make it to the international border more likely than not. And so there, there's a lot of evidence to suggest that if anything, in many areas, especially very poor parts of the world, climate change may kind of be an immobilizing force where, um, you know, for, you think of like poor households, you need a little bit of a savings cushion. You need some resources to be able to make a international migration, and it may be that we don't we don't see them on our headlines because they don't even make it to the border that the news media is covering. But it could be that they're for for any sort of uh, any number of of climate refugees that make it to the U.S. border or to the EU border. There may be many more who are suffering more silently and maybe making rural urban migrations within their country, uh, if they can do that. Um, but I just want to contextualize our conversation with, with that sort of idea as well, that, you know, climate change, while, all, while creating the conditions for a lot of reactionary uh, migration, may also be an immobilizing force that leads to more steady erosion of, of livelihood. Um, and then the other part, part that's related to that point that's related to that is if we are, let's just take the U.S., if we're truly serious about helping these communities or at least not adding to the harm, I think it behooves us to 
as Alice mentioned, be more curious about, okay, well, what are the factors that lead to these kinds of migration pressures? And instead of reactively, you know, fighting over whether or not to build a wall or to, God, shoot refugees as they cross the border, actually think about, can we divert our aid? Can we direct our aid dollars more wisely toward reducing the pressure to make these really desperate migrations in the first place? And that requires better understanding how climate risk, physical risk that I mentioned earlier, actually affects different populations because it's going to vary tremendously. And the kinds of adaptation solutions that could help communities stay with their families, stay with their friends, not have to make this move if they don't want to, um, we still don't know. Uh, we, we, there's still so much we don't know about what kinds of interventions work there. And to me, that's a, that's a risk, but it's also an opportunity, right? It, it, climate change is not going to happen you know, in, in sort of one fell swoop, it's going to continue over the next decades. And so if, if we're proactive about it, we have a chance of kind of reducing the harm proactively and preemptively, I would argue. Um, at least that's what kind of motivates my scholarship. And I'm sure Alice, and she's nodding her head, um, would agree. Well, you no, know, and that's a good set of thoughts to, to, to almost end on. You know, we're, we just got a couple minutes here before we're going to close out. Alice, just any final thoughts on policy? That was one of the kind of repeated questions that we got. Is there any thoughts uh, beyond what uh, Ji Sung just offered about the way perhaps we shift our our patterns of aid? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, for sure. I uh, just would like to first reiterate what Ji Sung just said because it's so important. Um, so you know, before we even talk about policy, just acknowledging that um, you know even among Global South nations and residents of Global South nations who are among the climate displaced populations, those who could afford to migrate are also ones who could afford to migrate. Um, and therefore, you know, you also, I guess, like end up thinking about um, the communities that are really actually left behind in that uh, the most vulnerable communities who can actually afford to migrate in response to climate change. So for example, I'm thinking in terms of, for example, age, the elderly populations of these at-risk communities who um, do not have the luxury <laughs> luxury of even being a refugee in crossing borders for um, seeking better opportunities. And um, therefore, even climate refugees themselves they're, uh, I mean, like sadly, for better, for worse, the lucky ones who are able to escape, who have um, the voice in terms of exit options from uh, those localities. And um, I guess, um, you know, thinking in terms of social and public policies, I think what Jisung emphasized is so important in the sense that it's not just about, um, you know, how we in the U.S., respond reactionarily to displaced populations and how we can accommodate these populations in our cities, um, how we can account for them in our social policies, but it's also about investing in uh, social policies that aid these people impacted by climate change in their host communities. Uh, so, you know, taking, this could take various forms, providing support, protection, resources to individuals and communities facing the consequences of these climate related events. Um, this could take form as dis disaster relief and recovery programs, programs that offer immediate assistance to those affected by climate related disasters. Um, I'll flag that a lot of these programs tend to be more reactionary as per usual for how you know we do things than they are uh, preemptive. And so it's often about putting out the fire once it starts and much less about preventing the disaster in the first place. And therefore I think um, shifting our focus to more preventative, preemptive measures in host countries could be highly, highly effective. And I'll emphasize Absolutely. that. I'm yeah. yeah. And also I think focusing on community resilience and uh, exactly. Um, well, thank you. Thank you. But there's never enough time. These conversations are always so robust and fun. Uh, and you guys are brilliant. And I look forward to future conversations. This is the second one for Dr. Park and I. And uh, 
And Alice, I hope that we have the opportunity to talk again soon. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to our Dean, Sally Bachman, to close us out. Sally. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ben, uh, Jisung and Alice. I, I, I couldn't be more thrilled and energized by this discussion. Um, Climate inequality is a growing area of focus for us at SP2, and I'm incredibly excited about the work that you all are doing in this area. Uh, this important dialogue is vital to our school mission, and it reflects our dedication to exploring the root causes of oppression and inequality. We remain steadfast in our commitment to inclusion, diversity, and social justice in all we do here at the School of Social Policy and Practice, education, research, scholarship, service, and community engagement. We work with lots of partners and it's a, it's a wonderful place to be working in this arena. I invite you to learn more about our work by visiting sp2upenn.edu slash inclusion. So we have the link for that. And I want to um, express my deep um, gratitude to everyone who joined us today. It's wonderful to think about the ways that we can work together to make our world a better place. Our next installment of the speaker series is going to be called How Are the Children Looking for Justice in Failing Systems, which is going to uh, be convened on November 16th. The event will feature two SP2 faculty members, Dr. Demarcus Jenkins and Dr. Noor Tarif, and of course, moderated by uh, ben Jella. So thank you, everyone. It's it's really been a fantastic hour. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.